it's late September and plies to sea in Europe. You and your hunting party are heading out to a nearby valley in search for game in order to start preparing for the incoming colder months. The mornings are becoming colder and colder with every passing day. You can feel the cold dry air on your skin. You start to walk down the hill and you can hear the dry grass covered in frost crunching below your feet. It was a very cold night and many more are about to come. You walk through several grassy hills and descend toward the small crystal clear stream that is flowing at the bottom of the valley. Your hunting party arrives at the bank of the stream where you decide to take a break from the long hike and drink some water. While your party is getting up in order to continue the hunt, you hear a distress sound from an animal not too far away from you. All of a sudden you hear a thundering noise just on the other side of the hill. The noise is approaching and getting closer and closer. And then you see a reindeer coming over the hill which in a few moments is followed by hundreds of others. You're just beginning to realize what is going on when among the reindeer you see a different shape running with a herd chasing a cow. You have seen this shape before. A chill runs down your spine when you realize what it is. It takes you a few moments to realize that you're seeing the second most efficient hunter in your world. In plain sight in front of you, a truly prehistoric spectacle is ongoing. You're witnessing a cave lion hunt. In a split second, the lion trips the cow using its claws and it sinks in a deadly bite from its 7 cm long canines. And then it starts to feast just a few spear throws away from you, just right on the other side of the bank. Hello and welcome to Hoplon Media. Today we'll be talking about one of the biggest cats that have ever roamed the world. A cat that has been fueling the imagination of our ancestors so much that they have depicted it in numerous caves all across Europe. Today we're talking about the cave lion. Pantera spelea or the cave lion or step lion is an extinct species of pantera that used to roam from the Iberian Peninsula all the way to what is today southern Alaska. It is still debated when the cave lion split from his other lion ancestors. Some estimate that the split happened as long as 1.9 million years ago, while others give a more recent date of just 600,000 years ago. The cave lion probably developed as a distinct species about 300,000 years ago. Pantera spelea is thought to be one of the biggest species of lions to have ever lived. A full skeleton of a male cave lion found in a cave in Siegsdorf in Germany measured 1.2 meters or 3 foot 9 inches tall at the shoulder with a length of 2.1 meters or 6 foot 9 inches without including the tail. This specimen was later surpassed by another male specimen who measured 2.5 meters long or 8 foot 9 inches without including the tail. This specimen was weighing about 339 kilos or 747 pounds. This is about 25 kilos more than even the largest African male lion on record which was the man-eater shot in 1936 just outside Hectorsprut in Easter Transvaal, South Africa, which weighed 313 kilos. It is estimated the cave lion was approximately 10% bigger than the current African lion. But this still would have placed them only in second place when it comes to size, since the American lion or Pantera atrox was significantly bigger than even the biggest Eurasian cave lions. Some paleontologists suggest that due to the skull resembling more to the skull of a tiger, the species was more closely related to the tiger. But later mitochondrial studies refuted this claim and placed the cave lion in the lion family under its own distinct species, Pantera spelea. Except for being slightly bigger, the skeletal reconstructions of cave lions are almost the same as their living counterparts. But thanks to cave paintings that our ancestors have left us across Europe, we can see they had a slightly different appearance. The biggest difference can be found in the absence of the mane in male cave lions. As it can be seen from drawings and other artifacts, male lions wore a small dorsal and ventral mane. Their tails had a similar dark fur tip and a sort of a side, side strip or different color pattern can be seen in drawings. Some cave art even shows the cave lions having some sort of stripe pattern on their sides. From the discovery of cave lion cubs found in Yakutia, Siberia, we can better determine the cave lion's fur color. 
The, ca the cabs show a lighter fur color than today linen lines and much thicker double layer fur that enable them to survive the harsh climate of Ice Age Eurasia. The lighter color was likely an adaptation to the different vegetation found in a mammoth steppe, which helped them camouflage better in their Ice Age environment. I will come back to the cave lion cubs at the end of the video, so if you like to hear more about that, stay with us. Now just imagine being a hunter-gatherer 30,000 years ago on the icy tundra in Central Europe and coming across a 340 kilo cave lion. It must have been truly a bone-chilling experience seeing such an apex predator of its time face to face. Now let's address the elephant in the room. Let's talk about the name. Why was it called the cave lion in the first place? Many people think the name derives due to the lion using caves as shelters like the cave bear who used to hibernate and spend the long winters inside them. This is likely not true, however. Many complete skeletons were excavated from caves in Europe and Asia and so giving it its name, the cave lion. It is however not likely that the lions were actually using caves as shelters or living inside them but were rather the victims of epic battles that were taking place inside these Eurasian caves. The evidence suggests that cave lions had a taste for cave bear cub meat and they were often preying on them. The easiest way to secure a kill on a cave bear was during the winter when cave bears were hibernating. If there was no bear cubs in the cave, the lion probably went of the weaker or injured individuals. The best chance the cave lion had to dispatch such a formidable opponent was, was by a swift bite to the neck or to the back of the head. However, the evidence of complete skeletons being found in caves suggests that this scenario did not always go as planned. Complete skeletons found in caves most likely means the lion sometimes ended up as victims. In most cases, one bite did not do the job and the cave bear woke up and after that a truly epic battle must have unfolded in the cave with the lion drawing the short end of the stick and succumbing to the brutal force of the cave bear. As shown on the documentary series Ice Age Giants from the BBC, scientists found in a cave in Romania a skull of a cave lion with bite marks on the back of its skull. The bite marks fit the teeth shape of the cave bear. Besides that, bears of today use the exact same gruesome tactic to dispatch their prey, which is by holding it down and continuously biting its prey to the back and the back of the neck until they succumb to these most horrific injuries. So where exactly did the cave lion live? The Eurasian cave lion inhabited mainly what we call today the mammoth steppe. This was an ice age habitat that encompassed most of central Eurasia, from the Iberian Peninsula all the way to southern Alaska. This ecosystem was mainly a dry or semi-dry grassland with very little trees. Contrary to what we have been shown in many movies and documentaries, there was relatively little snow due to much of the water being held up in glaciers. So the mammoth steppe was actually dry and without snow most of the time. It was very, very cold nonetheless. The temperatures in winter plummeted to minus 50 degrees Celsius and the summer temperature averaged just 8 to 10 degrees Celsius with approximately 150 to 300 millimeters of precipitation per year. Just to give you an idea, Los Angeles gets about 300 millimeters of precipitation per year, so we know we're talking about a very dry climate. I will make a separate video talking just about the Mama Step since this is an incredibly interesting subject on its own. But right now, let's get, let's get back to our Panteras Pelea. It is still debated whether cave lions lived and hunted in prides or as solitary animals. The answer is not as simple and straightforward as it might seem. It looks like cave lions had a flexible social structure and that they were able to hunt in prides and as solitary animals. In 1970, a steppe bison that was later named Blue Babe due to the color of the mineral that coated the mummy's pelt was unearthed from the permafrost in Alaska. This mummified bison had clear scratch marks on its back that were a clear sign of big cat predation. The American lion was absent from Beringia at that time, so that leaves us just with one option, the cave lion. They appear to have hunted in a similar fashion to modern lions, attacking from behind and grappling with the bison's legs in an attempt to trip it over. 
The bison had a torn lower lip, coagulated blood in its nasal cavity, and puncture marks on its nose that are matching the dimensions and separation of the cane lion canine teeth. All these wounds point toward the killing method that lions still use today, which is asphyxiation. The sheer size of the bison, which was a bull, by the way, point towards a joint effort of at least two lions, which supports the theory of cave lions hunting and living in prides. Beside this, there is another important fact pointing towards cave lions being pride animals, and that is cave art. In many cave arts around Europe, there are scenes depicting what looks like multiple cave lions hunting various animals, which is another point in favor of the pride theory. So there it is, right? The cave lion was a pride animal, just like it's his African cousins. Well, not so fast. There are a few important facts that could point toward cave lions being solitary hunters instead of pride hunters. So let's discuss the solo hunter hypothesis. One clue could be found in the male cave lion's absence of manes. The size of the mane in the African lion is correlated to the size of the pride. The larger the pride, the bigger the competition between the males in that pride. The bigger the competition, the larger are the manes in that specific pride. The lion's mane is usually a result of sexual selection by the lionesses. The bigger and darker the mane, the more dominant and testosterone heavy is the male lion. Following this logic, a big mane is useless if you are a solitary lion. This is a very interesting point that points towards the possibility of cave lions being solitary animals instead of social animals like their African counterparts. Another interesting fact that points towards the solitary hunter hypothesis could be found in the cave lion's diet. In 2011, a study published by Herve Bockerns of the University of Tübingen, Germany, used stable isotopes to find out what the cave lions were feeding on in Western Europe. Strangely enough, they found out that lions in Western Europe relied heavily on reindeer and other cervids and consumed very little bison or horses in contrast with the African counterparts, who mainly rely on buffalo, zebras and wildebeests. This was happening, however, where the cave lion's territory overlapped with the cave hyenas. In Western Europe, the cave hyena's main source of food was exactly that. The hyenas relied heavily on horse and bison, which leaves us wondering what could be the reason for the cave lions leaving such a desirable prey to their arch enemies. It looks like the cave lions were at a disadvantage in comparison to the cave hyenas. But how could this be possible? We all know what happens when these two predators clash in the open savanna. The lions usually have the upper hand. That is true most of the times, unless the lions are terribly outnumbered. The fact that cave lions were relying on smaller prey such as reindeer, which is big enough for a single lion to take down, and leaving the bigger animals to the cave hyenas, shows that lions might have been at a disadvantage in competition for food. And this could only happen if the lions were solitary hunters and they could not rely on other members of the pride to take down large prey and later defend it from other scavengers and competitors like the cave hyena. The evidence of maneless male lions and them choosing to hunt smaller prey all point in favor to the cave lions being solitary hunters. But how about blue babe? Don't the scratch marks on the carcass of the bison found in Alaska show it was killed by at least two lions? That is correct. However, this fact may only confirm the theory of the cave lion being a solitary animal in some parts of the world. Blue Babe was hunted and killed in Alaska in what was at that time the landmass of Beringia. The evidence shows that the cave hyena never ventured into northern and eastern Siberia and Beringia. Paleontologists suggest this may be due to the cave hyena not being able to efficiently dig dens further north due to the everlasting permafrost, making it impossible to dig dens in the frozen ground. This would leave eastern and northern Siberia a hyena-free zone where cave lions were left without one of their arch enemies and with much more desirable prey available at their disposal. This is a really fascinating theory. To think that the cave lion has been outcompeted by cave hyenas in some parts of Eurasia goes against everything we have been shown on various documentaries. 
To think that the king of the jungle was outcompeted by the scavenging hyena is almost hard to process. Now how does this evidence stand towards the seemingly solid proof of the cave art while multiple lines have been depicted together? Maybe the depictions were just cave lions during mating season when they would become more social animals, or maybe this was just an abstract idea from the painter. We might never know. From the evidence I came across, my opinion is that their social structure was much more flexible than the modern day lions, and that they found ways to adapt to colder climates by being able to live a solitary life while still being able to congregate in prides depending on their needs. Let me know in the comment section below if you found out some evidence that contradicts what I have just said. I'll be happy to hear it. As mentioned before in 2015, researchers came across an astonishing discovery of two frozen cave lion cubs who were later named Uyan and Dina. First it was thought that the cubs were two to three weeks old when they died, but it was later established that they have died before they could even taste their mother's milk. They were newborns when they died. It is possible their mother died soon after birth or that they were just simply abandoned. They were found with specks of soil in their foot tracks showing the possibility that they were still alive when a landslide occurred and buried them. What is amazing about this find is that they were found completely preserved with all their organs still present and almost intact. They are one of the most preserved animals to ever be found in the permafrost. The landslide created an oxygen-free environment which probably suffocated the cubs and which helped preserve the bodies in an astonishing manner. Then in 2017, in the same area, another cub was discovered. This time it was estimated that the cub was 44,000 years old and researchers think it was about a month and a half old when it died. It was named Boris. Boris had signs of severe trauma and researchers speculate a rock from the roof of the den or cave where he was living dislodged and fell on the poor little cub, killing him instantly. Finally in 2018, yet another cave lion cub was found in the permafrost by the same mammoth bone hunter that found Boris. This cub was named Spartak and later renamed Sparta, when the researchers found out the cub was actually a female. Due to the carcass being so close to Boris, it was initially thought that the cubs must have been siblings. But later analysis showed that Sparta was born 18,000 years after Boris. Some 26,000 years ago, Sparta's mother went out of the den and never returned. The mother either abandoned the cub or was killed during a hunt, which led to poor little Sparta starving to death. Researchers were puzzled why did she look so skinny, and some have even speculated the cub had been crushed maybe by a landslide. But later analysis have actually found zero fat in her body meaning that little Sparta died of a slow, grueling death due to starvation. However, the positive side of Sparta's story is that she is now the best preserved cave lion cub to have ever been found until today. Scientists are relying on the possibility that they could use Sparta's DNA to bring cave lions out of extinction. The cave lions and modern lions are different species but from the same genus. And due to Sparta being so well preserved, some researchers say it would actually be easier to bring back cave lions than mammoths. If bringing back extinct species is an ethical thing to do or not, I'll leave it to you to decide for yourselves. But just the thought of going on an ice age safari somewhere in Siberia and seeing these beasts hunting in their ancient homeland sounds like an extremely exciting thought. So what kind of relationship did our ancestors have with the cave lion? There are a few clues that can help us determine that. In 1937, excavations began in a cave called Holinstein Stadel in Bavaria in the south of Germany. After two years of excavations, a geologist named Otto Wulzing discovered a mammoth ivory statue of a half man half lion. The statue measuring just 31 centimeters tall was carefully crafted with stone tools and the sculptor took a lot of time and effort into making it. It is not very clear on what the statue actually represented, but we can clearly see that the cave lion held a special place in the everyday culture of our ancestors, just like the African lion still does today. The figurine probably had a role in some ancient rituals or religious ceremonies. We can only imagine a prehistoric scene taking place in a dark cave in South Germany. 
Let's just dive in this scene for a few moments and imagine how it must have looked like. The whole tribe has gathered before the annual reindeer hunt. Multiple fires are set around the worship place. Prehistoric drums made from red deer skin start to play to the rhythm of the human heartbeat. The shaman is wearing a cave lion pelt and is dancing in front of the lion man figurine. He drinks a magic potion and slowly goes into a trance. His body starts to shake when he starts to invoke the lion ancestors. He prays to them. He prays and worships the cave lion. He prays so that the lion's spirit can lead them to a plentiful and successful hunt. He prays to the lion's spirit so he can give the hunters its strength, so he can make them invisible in front of their prey, so he can give their legs its speed and their arrows the same ferocious bite. The shaman dances in front of the lion man and then transfers the powers given to him by the spirit to the hunters. The hunters feel an energy rush going through them. A chill starts to sweep through them from head to toes. Their senses become more alert. The shaman makes a cut on the right shoulder of every hunter. The wound starts to bleed, but they do not feel the pain. The spirit listened to them. He was generous. The hunt will be successful. Sadly, about 11,000 years ago, the cave lion went extinct along with most of the world's megafauna for the reasons that are still being debated to this day. There are a few theories about why this could have happened. The first theory talks about human overhunting. This theory suggests that humans have extirpated the populations of the big grazing animals and due to the lack of prey the predators like the cave lion, dire wolf, cave hyena quickly followed in their same fate. However, this theory has as many holes as a Swiss Emmental cheese. How come did the steppe bison go extinct while the same sized European bison and American bison survive? How did the horse survive just fine in Eurasia but went extinct in North America? How could a relatively small population of humans absolutely destroy such a vast number of animals? And why did some survive? These are just a few facts that do not add up in my mind and I'm planning to make a separate detailed video about what could have caused this massive extinction of prehistoric animals. Let me know down below if you want to hear more about this topic in the future. The other theory suggests that warmer temperatures led to changes in vegetation on the mammoth steppe and all across the world. Beside warmer temperatures, a warming climate meant an increase in precipitations which led to forests taking over grasslands. Contrary to what many people think, grasslands and not forests have the best possibility to support the greatest aggregation of large animals on Earth. Once this ecosystem is gone, the forests can support just a minute fraction of the large animals the grasslands were before supporting. Latest discoveries also suggest that a meteor strike in Greenland about 13,000 years ago might have tipped off the warming of the climate. Whichever of these two theories is true, the sad fact remains that these charismatic animals ceased to roam Eurasia and inspire our ancestors about 11,000 years ago. They joined the 99.97% of all the other species that have ever lived on our planet. I will leave you with the melancholic words of Carl Sagan. Extinction is the rule. Survival is the exception. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to our channel. Here at Hoplon Media, we try not only to explain prehistory, but we want to help you relive it and experience what it was like to walk with our ancestors during those fascinating times in our history. Thank you for watching.